Hello, everyone, and welcome to probing new public opinion data for an informed response. This is the second in a series of Zoom forums where we at Mass Inc. and the Mass Inc. polling group examine COVID-19 public opinion research and explore potential new policies designed to address the impacts of COVID-19. Last time, we looked into data on how the crisis impacted renters and homeowners and received great questions from viewers. So thank you to all who joined us then and thank you to everyone joining now. Today, we look forward to an informative and engaging discussion. So as you're listening, please feel free to make use of the chat function to share your questions. They may either get answered in the chat by the Massing Polling Group Research Director, Maeve Dugan, or will be answered during our conversation. Before we jump into the presentation, I first want to extend a huge thank you to the sponsors of this poll, the Barr Foundation and the Boston Foundation. Without your support, this poll could have not been possible. I'd also like to thank the sponsor of the Zoom Forum, Massachusetts Parents United, for sponsoring today's conversation. The survey we're talking about today asked Massachusetts families with schooled aged children how going from in-person to remote learning has impacted their children and themselves. We'll begin with a presentation on the data and analysis by Steve Gazella, president of the Massing Polling Group, followed by a question and answer session. With that, I want to turn the floor over to Massing Polling Group President, Steve Gazella. Steve, take it away. Thank you very much, Juana, um, and thank you all for joining. I'm looking through the participant list and seeing a lot of familiar names, um, and it's been way too long since we've all, <clears throat> all seen each other in person, but here's to hoping that someday soon we'll all be able to gather and do these kinds of forums in person. What we're talking about today is a survey that we completed just in the last couple weeks. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen where I've got a number of um, a number of slides that walk through some of the highlights um, uh, of the survey that we just conducted. The survey was among K-12 parents and caregivers here in Massachusetts. I'm going to skip a lot of the um, a lot of the pleasantries about the Massing Polling Group and introduction because we have so much interesting stuff to get through. Um, we're we're going to be challenged, I think, to get through it even in the time that we have that we have allotted. The results are based on a statewide survey of just over 1,500 parents of school-aged children in Massachusetts. One of the things that makes this survey unique is that we also included oversamples of Black, Latinx, and also Asian parents. So basically, what we did is we did a big national, or did, did a big statewide sample of 1,000 parents, and then basically boosted the number of Black, Latinx, and Asian parents that we had until we had at least 250 of each. So what that enables us to do, that you'll see as we walk through the presentation, is we can actually look at view at. Um, at opinion in much more granularity than we would normally be able to do, both because of the large sample size and also because of the oversamples. The survey was conducted uh, uh, June 4th to the 19th, and we did it with a combination of telephone and online interviewing. Um, and as we're going through it, uh, just something to keep in mind, the data was weighted to be both representative within each race and ethnic group, as well as with the gener for the general parent population. I'd like to echo what Juana said and just offer a huge thank you to the Barr Foundation and Boston Foundations for the sponsorship of the survey. Um, and also, I'd like to add one, which is the thank you to the Education Trust for the input and assistance that they gave, both in designing the questionnaire and then in interpreting the results. Um, so key findings. These I'm, I am going to go through a bit quickly because we've got all of this spelled out in much more detail in the data. But one of the things that jumped out right away was that there are so many different experiences that parents had. Basically every parent, every family, every school, every district was going through something that was unique to them. Um, and one of the ways that that showed up was the different levels of engagement that parents described for their students. So we're talking about online classrooms, one-on-one -on -one feedback, check-ins with the teacher that students had. There are big differences in terms of the frequencies that parents describe their students actually uh, having access to these kinds of, kinds of things. And the, these engagements were, to, were very closely tied to the overall satisfaction levels with schools. So basically, the, the more frequently your student was engaged with the teacher, the higher overall rating you gave to your school in, in terms of their response to the coronavirus. Some of the limitations, basically the things hindering people from being able to access um, those kinds of interactions, technological barriers was a big one. 
So internet, devices, email. Um, if you didn't have two, at least two of the three, or if you didn't have all three, there were big limitations in terms of how frequently you, your, your child was accessing those kinds of interactions. And then language barriers were, were another one. So uh, households where English was not spoken at home um, were much less likely to report frequent participation in these activities. And many actually also said that they didn't know if their school offered materials in other languages or just said that they didn't offer school materials in other languages, which was of course another barrier. In terms of um, what was actually happening, what parents were actually experiencing with homeschooling, there really weren't differences in terms of the rates of participation. So the number of parents um, across race and ethnicity that said that they uh, were not homeschooling at all really wasn't that different. But what was different was the kinds of activities that were happening. So if parents who, who were less likely to say that they were able to access school activities on the flip side, were more likely to say that they were supplementing with their own activities or give, and more likely to say that they were giving their children technical and academic assistance. Um, so we'll see what that looks like in the data, but I thought that was just a very interesting kind of counterpoint to, that, to the idea that there, that there were different levels of engagement with any kind of schooling that, that were happening. One other thing that we found that shows up throughout the data is that charter school parents were, were uh, more likely to report frequent contact that it extended both um, into academic engagement and then also in feedback on reopening, which was another topic that we'll get to kind of closer to the end of the presentation. Particularly for Latinx and Asian parents, there were big differences between um, district school parents and charter school parents. So looking ahead then to reopening, we found most parents actually are pretty confident that it can be done safely though 32% who express that they're not confident is still a very big number. And one of the things that makes that number worth uh, considering even more is that there are big demographic differences. Um, parents of color are particularly um, less likely to anticipate a safe reopening, which is uh, something that we'll look at a little bit more closer to the end. But parents by and large say they haven't been asked. So 68% say that they have not been asked for their views on reopening. Um, though here again, charter parents are more likely to say that they have been in communication. And then one final dynamic that we'll take a look at is that parents of young children have a, describe a very different burden than parents of older children, both in terms of the assistance that they were giving um, in terms of technology and then also with academics. Okay, so the actual numbers. Um, this first one right here is the rating that parents gave their schools for uh, their response to coronavirus. And the thing that jumps out right away is that, the, that these numbers look pretty good. You know, they're pretty high. We see 38% offering an excellent rating, 40% offering a good rating, um, and, and the remainder offering either a fair or a poor rating. So a couple, couple notes about that. Um, one is that parents often give their schools higher ratings on any education poll, um, even when you can kind of tell that that's not really necessarily reflective of how the school is actually doing. Um, the other is that there seems to be kind of a, perhaps a note of sympathy or a note of understanding that parents are extending to their school. You know, we're all in every sector of society dealing, things that we've never, dealing with things that we've never dealt with before. One of the things though that predicts excellent versus good, which are quite different as we'll see, versus fair and poor is how frequently your student was able to engage with the school. And there are big differences on, on, on those, those questions. Um, so satisfaction levels uh, between, between types of school, we see here that um, related to that frequency of engagement, district public schools got a little bit lower in terms of their percent who gave them excellent marks when compared to charter Catholic and private schools, just because again, as we'll see in a second, there were some differences in terms of the frequency of engagement. So overall, looking at participation in online classrooms, personalized feedback, or one-on-one -on -one check ins with teachers, this is the overall frequency of parents that say they, that their child either did them every single day, a few times a week, once a week, or less often. And the thing that really jumps out at me here is that is how different the, these numbers are, like how big of a range there are. There's not, uh, there's not any figure on this slide where you can say most of the parents did, said this, most of the parents said that. It really is, you know, parents describing the whole spectrum of frequencies from basically almost nothing to, or very infrequent to every single day being in an online classroom, every single day getting personalized feedback or having a one-on-one -on -one check in. Um, and as we'll see, there's some interesting ways that these particular, these particular ones vary. 
Um, but the most, frequent, the most frequent one out of these was participation in an online classroom where you had just over 70% saying that it happened either every single day or at least a few times a week. The reason that that matters, or one of the reasons that that matters um, in terms of understanding the survey data is that parents who gave excellent ratings were more likely to say these things happen frequently. So the percentages that you see in this table are the percent who said that each of these things happened at least a few times a week. Um, so starting with the left-hand column, overall 71% said that their child participated in an online classroom at least a few times a week. Same number we just saw in the previous slide. But then when you break it out by how, par how parents um, rated their schools, those who gave an excellent rating, 79% of them said that they participated in an online classroom a few times a week. Just a good rating, 73%. And then down in the fair and poor, we're down to 52%, just about half who said that their child participated in an online classroom with that frequency. We see that same pattern and even more, more kind of um, an even bigger display of that pattern happen in personalized feedback and one-on-one -on -one check ins where your excellent raters, 64% of them said that they, their child got feedback from their teachers at least a few times a week, down to only about a third, 35% um, of those who just gave a fair or poor rating. So you can really see the influence of this kind of interaction in terms of how parents evaluated how their school had done overall. Um, so another, th another thing that we looked at in terms of that, in terms of these things, were whether, par whether parents felt supported. Did they get the right amount? Did they get too much or did they get too little of um, various kinds of supports that, that they and their, their, children's, their children needed? So starting with communication about expectations, 62% um, said that they, they got the right amount. Um, and then each of the others, it was in the 50s. So most people said they got the right amount, but that's a lot who said they didn't get the right amount. And again, we'll see that there's a relationship between these, the perception that you were getting the right amount of support, the right amount of access, the right amount of assignments, the right amount of resources, and whether overall you gave your, your school an excellent, a good, or just a fair or poor rating. And that's what this, this uh, table here shows, which is arranged the same way as the one we looked at a couple slides ago. Um, where you have your excellent raters um, who said th these, per these percents are actually the percent who said too little, that they didn't get enough of these things, which was the most common reason for saying that th you didn't get the right amount. Very few said, or many less at least said, that they got too much of any of these things. Um, it was more likely that you said too little. And you can see that in terms of resources, those who gave a fair or poor rating, half of them said they didn't get enough resources. Half of them said they didn't have enough access. 44% said they didn't have enough communication about what's expected. And a third said not enough at-home assignments. So you can really see that, that there is, again, a close relationship between feeling like you got enough support and the, the overall rating that you gave your school. So in terms of these uh, contact frequencies, um, there's also some differences that are worth exploring in terms of type of school. Um, we're back to the, these percentages being the percent who said that each of these things happened at least a few times a week. And you can see that, uh, that and then the bars on this, on this chart are broken down by school type. So the red bars being charter, pink private, dark blue Catholic, and light blue district public schools. And you can see there that, um, that not so much for the left hand, for the participation in an online classroom, but for the other two sets, there, there are pretty big ranges in terms of uh, what, what charter schools were able to offer, private and Catholic somewhere in the middle, and then district public schools, where for instance, 34% said that they were getting a one-on-one -on -one check in with their teacher via video or phone at least a few times a week, compared to 58% of charter parents who said the same. So there were pretty big gaps there in terms of uh, the frequency of uh, frequencies of these kinds of interactions. We were then able to break these down by race and ethnicity. Um, and you can see that it doesn't necessarily conform to what you might expect from the from um, from these pa from you know past education polling and kind of what you might think if we hadn't done the poll. Um, but we'll see why these things break out this way specifically on on the next few slides. Um, basically, we found that there's little difference between race and ethnicity in terms of participation in an online classroom. Um, and uh, in terms of personalized feedback or one-on-one -on -one check ins, it, it's uh, black parents were the most likely to say that um, that they received these two and white parents, particularly on the one-on-one -on -one check ins, um, were the least likely to say that they that their child was doing that at least a few times a week. 
One of the reasons that the, the shape of these might not look as you might conventionally expect is that again, there's these big differences by sector between district public and charter schools. Um, these are the same percentages. These are still uh, at least a few times a week, the, the percent you said that their child had been doing these a few times a week. And you can see that the dark red bars there being district public schools and the pink bars being charter schools that um, particularly as you move down to the bottom two rows, you've got big differences, particularly there among Latinx and Asian parents, you've got you know, 30 plus point differences in, um, in the percent of parents who said that they were doing each of these at least a few times a week between parents of district public school um, children and, char and children attending charter schools. Um, so that's one of the reasons why the percents don't necessarily um, line up the way that we might expect. And I think also just a good illustration of how, um, you know, the, the pandemic and remote learning really has put every district and every school in a different situation and schools are reacting kind of in a lot of different ways that, uh, that kind of upend what we might conventionally think about, about education polling. So then looking at the other end of, of that engagement um, picture, what these percentages are, are those who, who are not connected, who are, who are non-connected to these kinds of services. Basically the percent who don't report frequent participation in um, this particular one is in online classrooms. So what we wanted to do is look at what, um, which demographic groups were most likely to say that they were not connected to, to online classrooms. And then on the next slide, we'll look at this for, for not connected to any sort of personalized feedback. Um, and you can see that 27%, that the very top um, group of no English at home, in other words, parents who reported that English wasn't spoken at home, um, reported being not connected to, the, to online classrooms um, with any, any regularity. You can also see that another major challenge is technology, and we'll see that here in a little bit. We'll dive into that a little bit more. Parents who said that they did not have enough devices at home, and we asked basically, do you have enough devices to both get uh, work done and schooling done? You know, because that's one of the stories you've heard a lot is we had enough internet for what we were doing before, but now we've got one, maybe two parents working at home. We've got one, two, maybe three kids trying to do school, and they're all trying to do it at the same time. We don't have enough devices for that. We don't have enough internet for that. Um, so it, it's really causing problems. Um, and that's something that we'll look at a little bit more in detail. We also see gateway cities up there, closer to the top of, of um, non-connection non rates. And we also see the influence of income when you kind of look at the top of the chart versus the bottom of the chart, um, where you've got upper income black families, for instance, at the bottom with 5% you know, non-connection. Um, and, and you know, you look up at the top and you've got uh, upper income groups across uh, race and ethnicity, um, I'm sorry, lower income groups across race and ethnicity less likely to report that they, um, they've been able to engage. These same basic trends show up for another of the items, which was this personalized feedback idea. Here we also see the influence of language and we also see the influence of technology. Um, so again, it's the, it's the no English at home group where we see most likely 39% reporting that they were not able to engage um, or did not receive personalized feedback on a regular basis. Um, we also see insufficient internet there is number three. Um, we also see district non-white parents um, and we'll look at that in a little bit more detail in a little bit. And once again, we see gateway cities and the influence of income. So a kind of a regular set of things I think um, show up in, in these charts uh, at the top and bottom of, of, of these kind of orderings. So one of, the, the, one of the ways that parents were countering that is, is um, whether or not they were supplementing and whether or not they were giving their children their own assistance. And we'll see how that breaks out across um, race and ethnicity in a little bit. But first, just the overall look. The beginning of the pandemic compared to now how many parents were either relying on materials from school, that grew from 55%, that's the top red bar there, up to 64%, um, versus uh, either supplementing with your own projects, or you can see not homeschooling at all actually went down somewhat considerably from 15% down to 16%, down to 6%, I'm sorry, from the beginning to now, now being when we took the poll a couple weeks ago. That has a very interesting breakout, which is, um, when we looked at it across race and ethnicity, what we see here is basically the overall percent who, between each, each, in each of the columns who were relying on materials from school versus supplementing versus relying on your own projects. 
And what we see is white parents were more likely to say that they were relying on material, materials from school, which when you think back to the connection rate slides we were just looking at a minute ago, you kind of understand how that kind of thing could happen. Whereas um, Black and Latinx and Asian parents were more likely to say that they were supplementing with their own learning projects and relying on their own learning projects. So th there was very little difference at all down in the next line in terms of not homeschooling at all. There was just a big difference in terms of what was being done and, ha and what had to be done because, you know, because of challenges of language, challenges of technology, challenges of income and so forth and so on. So this I thought was uh, just a really interesting uh, this and the previous two slides look at kind of the different situations that parents found themselves in and what they did in response. Um, this one is another, looks at it kind of in another way, which is the, the uh, bars here and the percentages represent the, um, the percent who said they gave either a great deal or a fair amount of assistance first with technology. Obviously that's something we heard a lot about, parents kind of being over their kid's shoulder, helping them log into this system and that system and understand how to use you know, all the different kinds of technological applications and equipment they had to use to, to do remote learning. Um, <clears throat> and then the pink bar being <clears throat> assistance with the actual schoolwork. Um, <clears throat> and you can see here too that we've got that uh, white parents were the least likely to say that they had to give a great deal or fair amount of assistance um, when compared to black or Latinx or Asian parents. So another really interesting comparison that I think kind of rounds out the picture we've been looking at for the last few slides. <clears throat> Another way that there were these kind of disparate burdens or very different experiences that parents were going through was by age of child and the level of the, the grade level that the child was in. So basically this is the same chart or the same numbers we just looked at, but instead it's broken out by the grade level of the child. And you can see that your K to two parents were doing way more in terms of uh, technology and schoolwork assistance compared to your high school parents. Um, this is something I think that uh, that going forward, if to the extent that remote learning is going to be happening next year, I and um, you know, and what kind of other childcare situations might be available, it's just something to to kind of keep in mind that there's there's very different burdens depending on the, how old your child is and what they're kind of able to do on their own. So. What did, what did it actually mean in terms of academic success? Um, this is a, a point where it's, it's worth pausing to note that all of this survey is from the parents' perspective. This is what parents saw. This is 1,502 individual stories, and it's not assessment data. It's not official statistics. It, you know, a lot of parents probably didn't really know at the beginning, as well as they do now, the academic situation of their children. So. Um, it's, it's, it's notable that now more parents think that their child is behind grade level than thought so at the beginning of the crisis. Um, that's the blue, bar, the blue line that you see increasing there, whereas fewer think that they're at grade level or ahead of grade level. But it is worth just pausing to make that note that this is not official statistics, it's not any sort of assessment data or anything like that. So um, parents, th more parents think their child is falling behind, but it'll take some time, I think, to kind of figure out the extent to which this relates to those to what official data actually can tell us. In terms of the emotional toll, though, we did also explore that not just the academic toll, but um, the question was whether the disruption to school caused by Coronavirus had a positive or negative impact on your child's emotional child's emotional well being. Um, and we see, first of all, the majority said 57% said negative, 17% said positive, a quarter were unsure. There were some differences though, but again, between um, parents of different race and ethnicity groups. And it comes into further sharper focus when we look at it between school sectors, because there too, we see that there are very, very large differences between um, what district public school uh, parents experience with their children and what charter school parents experience. Um, and that's what this this uh, this slide here shows. Basically, the um, looks like we have a typo. I apologize for that. On the negative, on the um, the red bar next to district public black parents. Um, but basically, these are the percents that show um, percents of district public versus charter parents who show who describe a negative versus positive emotional experience. And you can see the thing that jumps out right away is the um, Asian and Latinx charter school parents, um, but also across the race and ethnicity groups um, between district and charter parents, charter parents were less likely to describe 
a, a, or were more likely to describe a positive um, emotional impact. I think you, I would suggest that you can kind of take that back to the communication frequency um, and engagement frequency uh, questions that we've looked at a little bit and those that we'll look at a little bit later. Um, you know, that, that there was this, that there's this intersection between how parents thought the school did, how they think their child's doing, and how frequently their child was able to engage with their teacher and engage with their school, and how much their, their school was supporting them overall. So then looking a little bit at language, because this was one of the major things that we identified, um, one of the major uh, kinds of um, challenges we identified with engagement. This one is whether or not you think your, your school or district offers multilingual communications or provides information to parents in languages other than English was the phrasing of the question. And we found that um, overall 39% thought yes, 25% said no. Um, among parents who spoke Spanish at home, um, we found 21% thought no, and another 14% were unsure. So you kind of put those no's and those unsure's together, and you've got overall 35%. Among parents who spoke no English at home, um, about half, when you add up the no and the unsure, um, basically didn't know or didn't think that their, their school district offered English at home. I should also, I'm sorry, offered materials in English. I should note that the survey was administered in English and Spanish only. Um, so there, we didn't, uh, these numbers, uh, the number of parents who don't speak English at home was probably a little bit higher than what we found in the survey. And, you know, that, that group, the fact that half of them don't know that their school district was offering, um, offering materials in other languages is something I think that we should pause and kind of note and consider. It did have an impact. So not, not having English not spoken at home had an impact in terms of the frequency of, uh, or the feeling that you were getting the right amount of each one of these things. So the percent here is the percent who thought they were getting the right amount of at-home assignments, um, the right amount of resources to help your child and so forth. And the red bars are among families who spoke English at home. Um, the pink bars are those who reported not speaking English, English at home. You can see that there are big, big differences in terms of the feeling that you're getting um, the right amount of support and the right amount of communication as it relates to your child's education. There are also big differences in terms of the actual engagement between the child and the teacher. Here you see uh, participation in online classrooms, for instance. 72% of those who um, report English at home say that they were doing this at least a few times a week compared to just 54% of those who don't speak English at home. That's the middle set of bars. And you see this uh, similar gaps, um, about a 20 point gap also with whether or not you've received any kind of personalized feedback from teachers at least a few times a week. So again, <clears throat> language differences, language uh, barriers really were a big, um, a big major limitation for, for uh, parents in that situation. Um, looking at another element of, of language, um, we also looked at ELL students um, and found that overall, most parents whose children were getting ELL services said that they continued in some form or fashion. Um, <clears throat> we found that of, of that group, 63% said that they thought the services were adequate, 10% thought they continued but were not adequate, um, and then when you combine that with those who just were not continued at all or who didn't know, you've got <clears throat> about 36% you've got about 36, 36 overall who either didn't know or thought services were inadequate or thought ser services just didn't continue at all. So um, this is one where a majority, it's nice to have a majority, but there's still a very large swath of parents who said that there was some issue with the continuation of their ELL services. We saw the same thing. We also looked at the same basic question for IEP services and found a similar dynamic where a, a small majority, 57% of IEP, of, of parents of students with an IEP thought um, that the services had continued or were adequate and the rest were distributed between either inadequate or not continuing at all. So let's look then a little bit at the question of technology because that was another major barrier that we saw to participation. We looked at three specific things. Um, we looked at, do you have enough devices? Do you have enough inter good enough internet? And do you regularly use email? <clears throat> and found that there is, a, there is a big discrepancy when you look at each one of these three questions between income groups. Um, with the under 50,000 group, you've got 24% of them who say they don't have enough internet. 
I'm sorry, good enough devices, 17% who say they don't have enough internet, and 18% who say they don't regularly use email. And you can kind of read out to the right on these slides and, and see that these numbers decrease as you go out um, kind of to the, to the further right columns. <clears throat> I should note that the, we're going to be posting all these slides if they're not posted already to massingpolling.com. Um, so you don't have to furiously write down all these numbers, all these slides and all the cross tabs and top lines are all available at massingpolling.com. And um, one of my colleagues following along will uh, hopefully post the link there so people can go ahead and access that. Um, another thing that we found looking only at, at parents in the under 75,000 group is that there's a tech gap that's further exacerbated across race and ethnicity. Um, we saw this further up in terms of the difficulty in accessing particular kinds of engagement um, and, and some of the impact that these kinds of gaps have. But you can see that among families under 75,000, overall 15% describe themselves as not having at least two of the three key things that we asked about. So we basically, we made up the term tech burden for this. If you don't have two of the three, email, devices, internet, then, um, then you're included in this group. And 15% overall uh, don't have two of the three, 18% um, and then 18% of uh, white families under 75,000, 75%, or I'm sorry, 25% of black families under 75,000 and so forth. Um, but 15% is the overall number, uh, not actually just under 75. So just so you kind of know what that overall incidence looks like. So then looking ahead, what, what should we do about all this? Where do we go from here? Um, we asked about both catch up, catch, plans to catch up, and then also plans to reopen. These were plans basically just to make up the time. You know, how do we make up the time that the missed class time that we've had? And we found that the two ideas with a bit higher support for starting the school year earlier or continuing remote learning, um, the idea with the lowest level of support was making the school day longer next year. Uh, but none of them really got super high <laughs> um, support levels. They were all, you know, if it were an election, you'd be happy winning for 50, 53, 39. But if you're trying to get parents to agree on something, this is not necessarily the kinds of numbers you'd want to see. One thing we did find is that there was a gap here um, where there were differences in terms of uh, the race and ethnicity groups that we were that we included in terms of oversampling. Um, white parents were less supportive of each of the three ideas that were that were offered for uh, for making up time. Um, you can see that the biggest gap is there on the left with continuing remote learning during the summer where you've got 48% of white parents um, compared to between 63 and 71 of um, black Latinx and Asian and Asian parents. And those gaps persist though in smaller amounts in the other two make ideas to make up make up the time. <clears throat> Okay, that's, that's making up the time, but how about reopening? How about when do we actually reopen the schools? First, the first thing that we noticed is that most parents say, nobody's asked me what my opinion is. You know, I have an opinion, but no one's asked me for what, no one's asked me what it is. 68% of parents said, I have not been asked by my school or district about, uh, for feedback on preferences for reopening. Just 29% said that they had been asked. Similar to early, earlier communication slides, this is another one which varied very, very significantly by district public school versus charter, um, charter parents. We can see overall 24% of district public parents said they had been asked compared to 56% of charter parents. And we see that the gaps once again are particularly large for Latinx and Asian parents who are by a very wide margin more likely to say that they've been asked if they're a charter parent than they are if they're a parent of a district public school child. Um, another, then we asked about confidence. So, okay, if we did reopen, would you be confident that, that the school would be able to prevent the spread of coronavirus, basically? And we found that overall 64% said they were very or somewhat confident that that could happen. About a third, 32%, said that they were not too or not at all confident. Um, <clears throat> that is again a pretty wide margin, but as you can see, as you read down the chart, there are, there are big differences. Um, so among white parents, for instance, you've got 69% who say they're very or somewhat confident. Among black and Latinx parents, it's in the 40s. Um, and you can look at this a couple and kind of think about a couple other dynamics that we've seen recently, both in health statistics and in polling, you know, both, in ter both from, from those bars and also further down. Um, <clears throat> further down, where we see that particularly lower income or families with under 75,000 in household income um, were less likely to, uh, to, to say that they were confident. Um, 
one of the things that we've seen both in our surveys is that economic challenges uh, come, come with much more, with a much higher likelihood that your family, your neighborhood, someone you know, someone in your household has uh, suffered from COVID-19 themselves or had the symptoms of COVID-19. Um, and we've of course seen that in the health statistics as well in terms of you know, the municipalities where COVID-19 is most focused on uh, analysis of case, um, of actual cases of hospitalizations and so forth, uh, analysis of positive COVID-19 cases where they're, very, where they're not at all equal across income, not at all equal across race and ethnicity. So you can, I think, interpret this slide to a certain extent with those kinds of um, broader societal dynamics in mind as well. Um, there is, however, also an element of communication where um, <clears throat> I think you see uh, Latinx, particularly Latinx and Asian families, again, who are most likely to have been asked for their view, were also more likely to express confidence in reopening um, when compared to district public school, district public school parents. Um, <clears throat> interestingly, there was, no, there was no real gap among white public, district public versus charter school parents, um, but there were, there were gaps particularly for Latinx and Asian, Asian parents, depending on school type. Then we asked, okay, um, <clears throat> This is the last slide, by the way, and then we're going to open it up for questions. Um, thank you all for your endurance going through what is a ton of data. Um, what we asked was basically, should we go ahead with a modified reopening, kind of has been described in the plans that were released in the last week, or should we wait until a normal schedule is possible? And we found that overall, a narrow majority said, go ahead with the modified reopening. You can see in the lower left-hand portion of this slide what exactly we described. Um, we wrote and administered this poll actually before the plan was released. So we were going on what news accounts said and what we understood were, was kind of on the table for modified reopening. Um, basically found that just over half said they, they would go for that um, compared to 31% who said wait for a normal schedule. And very similar to the dynamics to what we saw on the previous slide in terms of confidence in a safe reopening in terms of who was more likely to favor a modified reopening versus who was more likely to say, go ahead and wait for a normal schedule. So with that, we are at the end of our slides um, and I would, would be glad to put some of them back up if any of the questions that people have specifically re relate to some of, some of the slides that we've looked at. Um, but with that, I think we can open it up to, to Q and A. So thank does anybody you. have gotten any questions? Yes, we have questions. So thank you, Steve, so much for that presentation. I know that it was a lot of data that needed to be covered and you did it so well. I wanna remind everyone that if you have any questions, please feel free to use a chat function. We have some of our staff reviewing your questions and sending them to me. And to get our question and answer session started, I wanna start with a question myself. Um, as an English language learner who came to this country in 1992, parents who did not speak English, I, I recall very vividly, Steve, um, seeing my parents not being able to engage with my, my public school um, experience while I was at the Haverhill Public School Systems and the challenges that came with that. And it clearly shows through the data that, you know, language barrier continues to be an issue in terms of engagement, in terms of even trust. And we could speculate that, you know, this lack of trust that we're seeing with Latino parents could be due to the fact that they're not necessarily communicating effectively with their school district. Um, I know I was really proud while I was at the state house to, to support the look bill, which gave districts kind of the flexibility to determine what you know, English language um, support and bilingual support would exist. However, I felt that it failed to really provide a, a, a path for, for, for funding, right? So here you are, you have the flexibility to say what you wanna do when it comes to bilingual education in your district, but we're not gonna support that with funding. And it clearly takes resources to hire bilingual staff, to provide professional development. Do you think this is an opportunity now in light of the data um, to really ensure that not just our state, but DESE is taking um, measures that really ensure that we're addressing what is clearly evident in the data. And that is that you know language is a barrier and certain parents and our most underserved students aren't necessarily getting the communication that they, they need during this time. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that that uh, surveys during this entire period have been able to do is kind of get out ahead of what some of the official statistics have been able to provide, you know, where um, we can go and ask a, a particular group, you know, what they've been experiencing and what day to day reality has been um, <clears throat> in a more kind of rapid way than 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 
than official sources can, and, and that's not a knock on them. You know, they're set up in a particular way, and it's not necessarily to quickly respond to this sort of thing. So, um, in this survey, we also did one on housing, for instance, that that was able to look at at you know rental and mortgage challenges and so forth. Um, these are the kinds of things that I think survey research has really been able to. Um, to give to give insight into. So my hope would be that this kind of data could be used by policymakers to, to kind of understand what parents have been going through, what kinds of challenges exist, and what the shape of those challenges are to kind of <clears throat> to build an informed response. You know, that's the name, of course, of this series, and that's something that in all the data that Massing puts out, we hope that we can help with. And particularly in services like this, I really hope that this data can be used in a way that, that helps to mitigate some of these problems. So when we do this survey again in six months or year, we see that a lot of these things potentially have been addressed. I could not agree with you more. Um, we now have a question from Jack Nee. The question is as follows. Were they relying on their own learning projects due to lack of engagement? Or was it because of device connectivity, technology issues, or because they felt that remote learning was not providing the educational quality students needed? That's a great question, and there, I would say that there are some limitations in our ability to, to you know, understand exactly what was, go what was going through people's minds. I think that we can make some inferences in the sense that it's often the same groups that are that are describing um, less engagement or less connection, who are also describing, you know, supplementing on their own. Um, so, you know, I think there probably is some of that. There, I, I think it's a perfectly fair um, assumption to say that there's probably also a lack of, uh, or the some parents were perceiving that the materials that they had access to were um, not adequate to what they wanted to provide their, their students. Um, but I think that that uh, you can look at it in terms of, you can look at it either way. Um, and I think that that's, that's a, a great question and certainly something that's, that would also be worth exploring. Great, thank you, Steve. We now have a question from Whitney. Were cultural racial differences and overall trust and, and, and expectations of government systems taking into account when hearing from parents? If communities are used to being underserved, um, their expectations and thus answers could be skewed. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's one thing you do see coming, coming through the data. I mean, we didn't, uh, I think that that's um, kind of underlying the data. You know, it's, it's basically latent within a lot of the responses that we see. Um, <clears throat> I thought it was particularly interesting to lay some of those, uh, those thoughts and assumptions along, alongside of what actual experiences had been and what, uh, you know, not just how you feel about things, but what things have actually happened, um, you know, which I think also helped to explain how, how people were reacting and what people were, were saying and thinking. Um, so I think that, yes, they certainly show up within the data, um, that, that absolutely that that dynamic is very much in the, you know, latent within the data. Thank you, Steve. Question from Jeff, any insight as to whether parents who are not confident about the safety of sending their children back to school will actually not send them back, i.e. will choose to homeschool them? That's something I'd love to ask soon, you know, because we, we uh, didn't have the, the full state rollout plan yet. Um, and as we all know from watching the numbers tick up and down, the numbers from Johns Hopkins, the New York Times, state by state numbers, you see, you know, infections overall nationwide going up. You see Massachusetts still looking pretty good. But what it's shown me is, and I think a lot of us, is just how fast reality can really change. So um, I think the fact that now we know what the plan is will help inform what parents are thinking. And also when we're going into the fall, what the picture in Massachusetts looks like in terms of our, our, own, um, our own numbers as it, as it relates to infections and so forth. So we didn't ask that in this one, but I, it's one that I think we should ask as, as we get closer. Um, it's, that's one where I would expect that as we all become better informed, we'll have a better way of addressing that both as individual parents. I've got two, you know, going on three K-12 kids of my own um, to, to kind of understand what we should be doing. How should we be thinking about this? What should we be anticipating both in terms of what we would actually be sending our kids to and what the kind of knowable risks are going around Massachusetts when the time rolls around in August and September? Yeah, I know. And just to add to that, you know, we're seeing that people of color were less confident in terms of what the data showed in sending their students back 
to school and they tend to be actually frontline workers they tend to be lower on the socioeconomic ladder so you know having that as an opportunity to homeschool them would be very difficult and i think this just adds uh, more attention of us really making sure we're communicating with families correctly to ensure that they're well informed and are building that necessary trust to feel that their students and children would be safe if schools were to reopen with the expected plans. We now have um, another question. It's an anonymous question. Is there any evidence that those without technology became more engaged as time went on because schools were able to furnish them with computers and hotspots? That's a really interesting question. Um, <clears throat> we did not ask about technology, like what you had before versus what you had now, um, but that that's a really interesting question. I mean, I think we can probably, well, I was gonna say there's there's news accounts that suggest that certainly many more devices were, t were distributed as time went on, which would permit that kind of increased connectivity. Um, you know, but then we still saw by, even at the end of the school year, that Boston Globe story, for instance, on Worcester, which was still reporting a pretty high level of lack of access um, to, to necessary technology. So uh, we don't have that particular answer, but that's a really interesting question um, that, that I'd love to be able to explore. Yeah, and I think uh, as your data demonstrated, Steve, it would have been very different for every district because that's what we were able to show. There were some um, rudimentary things we were able to see through the data, but there were, there were different experiences depending on which school district you were talking, talking to. But it would have been great to see on the onset of COVID, you know, March, late February, where things stood as compared to today. <clears throat> Another question, and it reads as follow. Can the state and schools make parents more comfor comfortable with returning to school by commuting, communicating the public health evidence informing the reopening plan? That's a big communications challenge, which I, uh, I don't really envy and don't, don't feel particularly that I could address effectively. I mean, I, it, there's certainly work cut out for the state at this point. I mean, one thing that we didn't really discuss, we, we were kind of looking at the overall demographics by, at the state level. <clears throat> but of course, as we all know, um, it's not like each of these demographics is distributed equally between school districts. So you could have some school districts where the very large majority of parents feel just fine about the idea, where at, in other school districts, you could have a very large majority who do not feel fine about, um, about reopening the school. So you could have um, particular districts, particular schools where there's a lot more tension. Um, but in terms of how the state should go about it, I think that would be something we'd have to explore in a different survey. Because in this one, we just had, we were, we were covering so many other things, we didn't really look into that specific question. I'd also just say that we're gonna know so much more as time goes on. You know, we know so much more even than we did a few months ago. You know, you think back to a few months ago where it was like, we were hearing things like, the virus survives on surfaces for nine days. And if you like even touch a doorknob that someone else might have breathed on, like you're definitely gonna get sick. You know, think of how different that is than now where we know you can gather in many cases outside with masks on, it's really indoor and you know, breath droplets and so forth. We just know so much more now and that's gonna continue, I think. So exactly what the state needs to say is a tough question for them. Um, but I think that as the science, as we all grow to understand it better and the plans are refined, that's, that's a big task that they're gonna to have to tackle. Sorry, I was muted there. I agree with you, Steve, and I think what your data was able to demonstrate very clearly is that 68% of parents have not been reached out to to kind of get any sense of where they stand on reopening plans. So clearly communication could be definitely heightened and it'd be interesting to see how the state responds in the next couple of months to this. Another question, and it reads as follows. Do parents think public schools will have enough resources to provide children with a quality education next year? That's a loaded Good. question, Steve. <laughs> it is, and I, we did not ask that particular question. I mean, I think we can um, read the news and probably guess what the answers to that are gonna be. You know, states and municipalities all across the country, of course, are going through budget challenges, but I won't drag on too much because the short answer is we did not ask that question, but it's like another really interesting one that, um, you know, would be, a, would be good to ask on a future poll. Great. Um, the next question, should we end early? There, oh, sorry, that's not it. <laughs> <laughs> what do we know about differences in instruction provided by urban versus suburban and rural districts for the students who didn't have technology or language barriers? 
That's a great question. And that, that I think is one of those things where we don't necessarily have, you know, great aggregated official statistics. You know, um, we may have them soon. We may see them start to appear and be collected over, you know, kind of over the summer and get a better retrospective picture of what was going on. But <clears throat> at the moment, as, I, as far as I'm aware, we don't really have a great sort of aggregate picture of what happened at the state that we can kind of slice and dice to, to get a sense of what was happening in each individual district. You know, districts, even within districts, schools, even within schools, teachers reacted so differently to this that I think that it'll take some time before we have a, a more complete picture of what was going on. Thanks, Steve. Um, another question here. You mentioned that there was an increase in parents' belief or recognition that their students were behind grade level. Do you know if they attributed that to learning loss due to school closures or just their own greater awareness of their students' progress, notwithstanding COVID closures? That's a great question. And <clears throat> that's, that's, uh, we don't really necessarily know the answer to that. We, we know that at the end, people were more likely to think their child was behind grade level. Um, but we had, there's so many confounding factors to that, that uh, kind of analysis. Um, you know, what parents, they, as you point out in your question, your excellent question, the uh, increased awareness that parents gain of their own students' um, situation, comparing the beginning of the pandemic to the end. Mm -hmm. um, you've also got, uh, the, you know, students' actual situation, you know, and what they were able to, to learn or not learn and whether they could connect or not connect. Um, and you've also got uh, some imprecision at the, at the, of understanding at either end of what being at grade level means, because it meant something very different in March than it means now. If, every, if most or all students have gone through this, then what is it being at, then each parent can interpret a bit differently what being a th ready for third grade or ready for seventh grade actually means, because every other student in their school is basically in the same situation that they are. So it's a really interesting question that, would, that we could do a whole other survey about and I, you know, explore that in a lot more detail, I think. No, I agree. And another question here, Steve. Were there any questions around mental health supports provided by schools or community, wondering how our families are navigating stress, especially for the Latinx population that has limited access to Spanish language resources, be it knowing that some, something exists or having access to professionals that are linguistically and culturally competent? That's a great question. Um, it, we have asked in other in this survey and others just about the, basically the emotional impacts of, of the pandemic. The survey asked about it on in terms of students. We also asked it earlier, um, a couple months ago now, just in terms of whether people are feeling more sad and depressed now than they were before this started. Mm -hmm. And we found that there are very big differences across demographic groups um, in terms of who who. Uh, it's feeling like they're encountering mental health challenges at, um, and the percentages there. Uh, earlier on, it was particularly acute among people who were encountering economic challenges. So if you'd lost your job, if you'd been furloughed, if you'd lost pay, um, it, if you were a part-time worker, if you were an hourly worker, all of those things were closely related to much higher incidence of encountering these kinds of issues. And in this survey, you also saw that there were, there were big differences in terms of uh, the mental health impacts on students. We did not specifically ask about what services were available, but that would be another great question to, add, to ask in a, in, a, in a future survey. I agree with you, Steve. Um, I want to take this time now to remind everyone that all of these slides, the data, cross tabs will be available on the MPG website, the Massing Polling Group website. Um, and it has also been included, a link has also been included in the chat. Now moving to the next question. Um, from Austin, can you discuss trends or tensions in family perspectives on their individual school versus system versus the state? For example, it appears Latino families had high levels of contact and confidence in their, partic in their school particularly, but then lower trust in questions related to Massachusetts. Yeah, that's a great observation. I mean, I think it would, I think that um, we didn't ask sort of one question that would would tie that all together neatly, but um, what, you know, we certainly found that there were dramatic differences in confidence uh, between school type um, and particularly with, particularly among Latinx families. Um, if it was, uh, if they were, if their child was attending a public versus a district school, for instance. Um, but in terms of confidence in 
every different level from the teacher to the school to the municipal, municipal government, state government, and so forth. We didn't explore that specifically. It may actually show up kind of latently in the data. That'd be something that I'd have to dig into. Um, if, you, if anyone else would like to dig into that, we'd also encourage everybody to take a look at the cross tabs and top line on the website. And um, if you write up anything, you know, shoot it our way, we'd love to have a, have a look at it. Um, off the, it, it. What you're saying rings true to me, but I didn't look, I didn't examine it with exactly that kind of frame in mind. Thanks, Steve. Um, final questions. We're getting to our last one or two questions. The following one is, the survey shows parents are putting more time into helping young children, but they were most worried about teens falling behind. What can we take away from that? Yeah, a couple things, I think. I mean, I, I, this is what I read into it. Um, you know, it may be my own, my own uh, situation at, in my own family, because I have a kid had now a first and third grader, but a kindergartner and a second grader. And, you know, there was very, there was just a lot that needed to be done for them. You know, a kindergartner doesn't know how to type and is, you know, doesn't know how to spell and doesn't know how to log into things, for instance. Um, Whereas the actual learning is something that you can much more easily help with. Then you're talking about a high school and they can run circles around you in technology, but um, you know, you, if you want to help them, the, the subject matter and the material is a lot more advanced and a lot more specific and could potentially be something that you're less able to, to help with. Um, so you can understand, I think, why you would be more worried about your upper income, uh, or I'm sorry, your upper grade level students, um, whereas your lower grade level students were the ones that actually were more demanding in terms of help with their class classwork and help with the technology. And as you're saying that, Steve, that brings up um, some cultural implications that I think we should also consider in terms of when you're talking to lower income parents, uh, immigrant parents who do not regularly use a computer, who do not have e access to email. And so this has been the only, you know, format in terms of communicating with, with parents, but there are parents who just have no exposure to that, right? That That's just a burden within itself. And how do we take that into consideration moving forward in light of, you know, yes, we have some reopening plans that um, came out last week, but, you know, we're still in, in the unknown. We don't know what's going to happen in the fall. And that should also be taken into consideration as, you know, an immigrant parent that doesn't have access to a computer, doesn't have access to an email, never utilizes how can they really engage with their student and measure their child's ongoing academic um, uh, success? So food for thought, one final and last question, and it reads as follow. So how would you answer how much learning will be lost? The central question in title of this event. Um, boy, that's a tough one. I mean, it, it's, I would suggest that on that, that question, we, uh, the better way to answer answer that is not available yet. It's when we have better official statistics, better data from the school and so forth. Um, it certainly appears, if I had to predict where the shape of it, that there will be big differences in terms of um, the learning that was lost across school types, across income levels, um, certainly families facing language or technology challenges. Um, the actual quantity, I think, is hard to answer, but just in terms of like where we could probably expect more versus less, I think if you look at the contours of some of these slides, they'll give you a sense of what the shape of the challenge that we're going to face kind of looks like. And just to add to that, Steve, I agree with everything you just said. We hope that the data that we were able to present today um, helps inform what, you know, our state government, with the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, what our local school districts will start considering as we move forward to help inform some of the discrepancies we saw in this data. And that is our, after, our time this afternoon. Thank you again, everyone, for joining us and for submitting your thoughtful questions. If you enjoyed this, please stay tuned for upcoming forums in our series, Probing New Public Opinion Data for an Informed Response. We will be back in your inbox soon with further details on that. But until then, thank you all for tuning in and be well.